John Gatewood at Gatewood Well Solutions. Welcome to our weekly market commentary broadcast. Joining me today is our Chief Investment Officer, Aaron Tuttle. Now we are broadcasting from two different locations because we were unable to access the office today due to COVID restrictions. So our format will be different. I hope you find today's broadcast informative as Aaron addresses questions we are getting regarding the reliability of the polls, the surge of new COVID cases, and a recent publication by the World Health Organization regarding lockdown effectiveness. Take it away, Aaron. Thanks, John. And I would say that uh, I'm very grateful we're not in the same location, but I would be teasing. Uh, no, really, I'm very happy that we have all of this technology where it allows us to meet virtually. And uh, while 2020 would certainly be a different year if we didn't have a lot of this, uh, a lot of these ways to solve some of the problems that we've dealt with. So let's start out where we always start out with, and that's the coronavirus timeline, industrial activity rebounding in fourth quarter. That data still uh, is favorable for that thesis. Uh, the GDP will be coming out this month and for the quarter, and it looks pretty strong. Uh, we're hoping that continues on into 2021 so that we, we see that rise. Uh, as, as of right now, the only thing that kind of detracts from that thesis would be the money supply, which we'll get into uh, later. But let's jump into the polls. Uh, as you have mentioned, uh, we've been doing a deep dive in these polls, and we think the double-digit lead that is often capturing the headlines is not really reflective of reality. We think this is a much closer election. Uh, in addition, the a lot of times those polls are based on the national average, and we know from 2016 that the U.S selects for president through the Electoral College. So we're gonna focus on six states, Arizona, Minnesota, Wisconsin, Michigan, Pennsylvania, North Carolina, and, and Florida. Uh, and if we look at those six states, we can actually see bottom right hand uh, on those battleground states, President Trump is actually doing slightly better than he was in 2016. So this is one of the reasons that we think the polls are not accurately catching uh, the uh, um, uh, how close this race really is. And we just have to go back to 2016, where uh, Reuters, just the day prior, had indicated that uh, Secretary Clinton had a 90% chance of winning. And we all know the history on that. That was not accurate. And, and I want to call out uh, the, uh, the one caution the article uh, mentioned, that 10% chance for President Trump was based on his performance in Florida, Michigan, North Carolina, and Ohio, as well as Pennsylvania. Well, we're very familiar with the six states because those are the six states you had in Arizona, uh, and, and we got them. Uh, so we continue to watch this. We are skeptical of the, the wide margins. Uh, and we'll get into why we think those wide margins are there, but we're not the only ones that are skeptical. Uh, there's a lot of faith uh, that has been lost in conventional polling, uh, and there are different avenues that people are trying to do to try to understand what is actually happening under the surface. Uh, and a, uh, an AI-based social media analysis uh, that was done on Twitter feeds uh, indicates that this is a very close uh, race. Now, the algorithm focuses on likes and dislikes as well as analyzing the, the comments uh, section, and it has it pretty close. Uh, however, what is not being taken into account in, in our kind of pushback on this, where we think that, the, uh, that it's even more close or maybe even a slight advantage to Trump, is the censorship that has been happening on some of these social media platforms uh, with Twitter. Uh, now, the, the censorship is on both sides. There's uh, a censorship for uh, those that would lean to the left that are not in the mainstream and those that are also on the right. But we, we, more, we mainly hear from the right to the point that that uh, there are actually alternative uh, companies that are coming up that have been gaining against Twitter, uh, or at least picking up people that have been dissatisfied with Twitter. Parler is one example. So if you have an AI system that is analyzing uh, the, uh, the tweets, and there's a large section of uh, conservative voices that have left Twitter and gone to other platforms, uh, that it may not be accurately catching the, the whole population, because there is a bias uh, to that, uh, that sample. Uh, also, if we look at it, speaking of, uh, of different biases of, of samples, some of the internal polling uh, was reported on by the Biden campaign, uh, 
uh, where they are also uh, not taking those double point leads uh, as uh, something to just rest on, uh, where the campaign manager uh, came out in a video and said uh, to, that this is much closer than it's being reported. Uh, now, during that call, they were asking for campaign contributions. So uh, there's several several ways to interpret this. It is one that the, the that this is a closer race. Uh, two that they don't want people to think that well, uh, Biden has it in the bag, and I was going to vote for him, so I'm just going to sit this one out. Uh, that that could be a um, a self non fulfilling prophecy. Uh, so uh, they don't want to, to have people just uh, sit there and not come out because then that could be uh, detrimental to uh, their lead. Uh, and there's also contributions. Campaigns always want contributions whether they're ahead or not. Uh, now it could be a combination of all three, and we believe it is a combination of all three of those. Now we're going to get into uh, the data here, and most of that data, whenever we're looking at how polls are, are skewed, uh, skews in, in the favor of, uh, of President Trump. There is one area that we think uh, will offset some of that, and that is the older voters. Uh, and when we look at voter turnout, uh, uh, which is really what we're trying to predict, whenever, uh, or the polling agencies are trying to predict, uh, that's the art and it's the most important part is trying to understand who is actually gonna turn out. One area that you can pretty much depend on uh, turning out is the older voters. And the uh, that demographic seems to have moved away from President Trump and towards uh, Senator Biden. Uh, so he's uh, so President Trump is losing some of that. He 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 made uh, uh, great inroads in 2016, and if those are are impacted, that could mean that he does not get reelected. Especially since many of the battleground states have larger than average uh, uh, demographics to uh, the older voter, meaning that there are more, as a percentage, there are more older voters in those battleground states than there are in the national average. Uh, and we can just look at that off to the right. We can see Maine has the highest share of residents that are 65 or older. Now that's not a battleground state, but let's go right down the list. Florida, Pennsylvania, uh, New Hampshire, not a battleground, but Arizona, Michigan, Wisconsin, Ohio, Iowa, North Carolina. These are all important states. Uh, and if that shift is uh, for the older voters who are more likely to turn out are going to, for uh, uh, Senator Biden, that could spell trouble for President Trump. Now let's get into some of the other uh, uh, biases that are, are, are built into this. And remember, this is all methodology. It's trying to forecast what the voter turnout will be. It's not just calling everyone up. You got to start to to shuffle uh, the ratios based on what you expect is going to actually vote. Uh, and most methodologies will oversample Democrats. And now Gatewood Well Solutions believes that there's a core group of, of individuals that are really difficult to count. Uh, they tend to be socially conservative and kind of middle of the road blue collar. So if you want to stereotype them, think of high school educated white rural voters. And these voters tend to align uh, to the unions. And uh, as, Clint, as President Clinton said, people vote their wallet. So most of the time, these individuals are going, going to vote Democrat. However, they also will uh, have conservative viewpoints when it comes to social policy. They're more likely to be uh, pro-life. They're going to be pro-Second Amendment. Uh, and, and they're going to have things that are, are more reflective of that rural voter. But most of the time, they uh, you can capture their vote by oversampling Democrats. The complication comes in whenever there's a populist message on a Republican ticket. And President Trump has done a very good job of casting himself as a populist. Uh, and a lot of the, the economic policies that he's put in place where he's trying to move businesses and manufacturing back to the U.S., uh, will be viewed favorably by a lot of these typical uh, union-like voters. Uh, so we don't think that actually gets caught well in, um, in the polling, and that is the reason for the oversampling of Democrats, but that may not translate into Democrat votes. There's also oversampling of women. Women tend to vote more often, and, and they're more likely to vote Democrat. And if we look at historical trends, the voter percentage has continued to move up where more women are showing up to vote. 
Uh, that uh, we think that trend will still stay in place, but we think there's going to be some dampening. There seems to be a lot more enthusiasm uh, for Trump, especially along, among those white uh, rural voters that we think are going to turn out. Now, worst case scenario uh, for President uh, or Secretary <laughs> Senator Biden, I'll eventually get it correct, uh, is a 50-50 turnout. So we don't think the males are going to out uh, produce uh, or out. Uh, they're not going to show up in, in greater numbers than females, so it might just be an equalization. But even if that's not the case, remember all those registered gun sales have been dis disproportionately female and minority. When you do a background check, you have to fill this information out. We have that data and we can see that females and minorities are the biggest new gun buyers and they're more likely to vote for uh, Trump because he is the perceived law and order candidate yet to be determined. Uh, now, many polling agencies are expecting higher turnout similar to 2012. Now, there are a lot of people that do not like President Trump, and we are not saying that they are not motivated to go to the polls. We are, but we don't see the type of enthusiasm uh, in the uh, Democrat base the way that we did in 2012 for President Obama. So we just don't see that uh, evidence that it's gonna have a turnout like 2012 we expect something more like 2016. We could be wrong. And, and if we're wrong, using uh, the way that they capture this is they use registered voters versus likely voters. And if you use registered voters, you're going to capture more Democrats in the poll, uh, and it's going to look like it's a, a greater lead. If there is high turnout, then the, the current polls are probably correct. If it is not high turnout, we think uh, the, uh, the, vote, the, the polls that are using likely voters uh, that favor or uh, give a slight advantage to uh, President Trump in these battleground states are, are more likely uh, to uh, to turn um, to turn out. So uh, uh, once again, uh, that does not. So it's not a, a pro Trump. We think Trump is going to win the election because there's still that offset by uh, the older voters turning away. Uh, another component that is not being talked about much is that there is virtual college campuses uh, going on and the Democrats have historically used uh, the, the college campuses as a rallying point in a way to uh, increase the voter count uh, by having a lot of those students go. Now, we know that some young voters are going to turn out, but if they don't have that uh, social pressure uh, and a reminder uh, as well to go to the polls, that's unlikely that the, uh, the college age demographic is going to show up in, an, in a meaningful way uh, similar to 2012. We, we just don't see that uh, materializing in the votes, and that's why we think the double digit votes are not as uh, uh, reflective of reality as we, we see it. Now, there's two things here, rallies and registration. I'm sorry to spend a lot of time on a couple of these slides, but there is a lot to go through. Uh, if we look at just registration, uh, and we can really go in, and work off of J.P. Morgan's top quant, Marco Kolanovich's work, uh, he compiled uh, the, the, the changing of your registration. So if you're a Democrat and then you, you change your registration or Republican, uh, it's it's a good assumption that that person, one, is motivated because they've already had to take action to uh, change their registration affiliation, and they're likely to show up, and they're likely to show up and vote Republican. And he did a regression analysis uh, on the battleground states as well as Pennsylvania, and that regression analysis bore out that that, that assumption is true. Does it make it true? Uh, no, but I think that there is uh, certainly... A reason to think that it has basis uh, if you've already taken the action once again to to flip your registration uh, you're, you're likely to go to vote and you're likely to vote to your new registration uh, now why does this matter well if we look at Pennsylvania uh, in 2016 President Trump had a lead of 44,000 votes the the amount of registered Republicans on net or the gain that they have relative to Democrats in 2016 is another 153 uh, thousand uh, voters in Pennsylvania. So that, that kind of skews the odds uh, in uh, President Trump's favor. Uh, Florida and North Carolina uh, as well have picked up more registered Republicans for those battleground states. Uh, Arizona, not as big. Uh, we do think that that is becoming more and more of a blue state whenever we're running our analysis. Uh, we think Pennsylvania will be red, uh, Florida will be red, 
Uh, we're not so sure about Arizona. Uh, so uh, that's where we are. Now on rallies, uh, this is a way to really gauge enthusiasm by looking at the crowds. Uh, and uh, President Trump certainly has much, uh, 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 more people are attending his rallies than, uh, than Senator Biden. But there's a caveat there because this is 2020. Republicans, if you poll them, most Republicans are not concerned or scared about getting the coronavirus. That's not the same, uh, or that's not true for Democrats. They are far more likely to be concerned. Uh, so Democrats are less likely to attend a rally because of fears of the coronavirus, and it, it may not accurately gauge that enthusiasm. There could be a lot of enthusiasm, uh, but they choose to stay home because of the risks of attending these rallies, where that's not the case for Republicans. So we can't just gauge enthusiasm by rally uh, attendance. Does it mean that, they, that there is or isn't a lack of enthusiasm there? It's just too complicated and there's multiple factors uh, that could be contributing to uh, the attendance on these rallies. Now, if we look at a model, and we, we've been very critical of the way that polls are, are created and the art of trying to determine how to get voter turnout, uh, there is a model uh, by a professor, uh, and uh, it, it's known as a primary model, and it has been very accurate. We're seeing headlines. It, it's made its rounds through the media, um, and what it does is it doesn't make adjustments based on any polls or anything. It's, it's just based off hard data, and that hard data is coming out of the primaries, so how many people showed up and voted for that candidate in the primaries, as well as registration. Uh, and, and that sounds great, and, and the track record is stellar, but it, it's, they say they predicted 24 out of the last 26 elections. Um, this model hasn't been around for the last 26 elections. So what's happening, and we see this a lot with investment strategies, it's form fitting. You go back historically, you look at the data, you say, hey, what is most predictive, and you create a model. Well, of course it's going to predict well in the past. It has nothing to say about the future. So if we say there are serious aims whenever uh, the polls are in place, there are serious aims in claiming this has predictive power when it hasn't been around. That doesn't mean it doesn't have sound basis or that, uh, uh, that it's not a, a good uh, analysis or that it can't be predictive. Uh, we, we think this is tighter. This, this assumes that uh, Trump has a 91% uh, likeliness, just as much as we're cautioned on the 90% for Senator Clinton and similar uh, for Biden. We, we throw a lot of caution here, especially uh, with the way that uh, a model is being used. The, the models just are not that good. Um, now, it, uh, it, it could be that those models are just dumb, uh, dumb luck. Uh, and if, if we look at some other things that are uh, possibly dumb luck, one is the um, how well are you doing relative to four years ago? And President Trump scored 56%. This is a very high score. And it actually historically speaks well for President Trump. And this really comes out of uh, a, a comment whenever Reagan was running against uh, President Carter uh, on him asking the audience, just how well are you doing compared to four years ago? And that was considered a turning point in that campaign that brought President uh, Reagan uh, to the White House. Uh, and, and since then, Gallup has been uh, doing this. Now that 56% score is certainly higher than Reagan's as well as uh, Barack Obama's, but there's really not a large uh, amount of elections between Reagan uh, and, and today. There's only a handful of presidents that that would cover. So this could easily just be dumb luck. Um, and, and once again, speaking of dumb luck, the, the, the media loves to, to point these things out uh, where they're more just looking back on data. And Vigo County's presidential picking rate, uh, record uh, is one of those where this county has gone with the, uh, the, the person that's won the election uh, all the way back to 1956. And if we look at that county, it is certainly going, likely to go for President Trump. Uh, but who knows? I mean, how many counties are there? There's 50 states, and we know that there's probably more than five counties in, uh, on average in every state. So that's 250 counties uh, that have gone through uh, elections every four years since 1956. Certainly, there's going to be a couple of counties that have pretty good track records uh, 
uh, just by chance. Uh, and so that's likely uh, what's happening here. It could be that there is merit behind the uh, looking at this as a representation. Maybe it uh, better reflects that blue collar worker, the one that is so hard to pull, but oftentimes could uh, shift uh, uh, that, that middle of the vote. Uh, that is possible. We think it's more uh, it's just it, it, it's dumb luck. You can when you when you have that much data, that many counties. Of, of course, there's going to be some uh, that have uh, followed the the presidential election going back. Another area that we see uh, a lot is, is campaign contributions. Also, this has merit. Uh, if we look at the contributions, uh, uh, Senator Biden does lead uh, President Trump at 531 million versus 476 million. Uh, but what you really want to look at for predictive power is how many of these small donations, because small donations are likely uh, to translate into um, to, uh, to votes. Uh, and President Trump is well ahead uh, at 251 million versus 203 million small donations for, for Biden. So this, once again, is just kind of saying that this election is closer than what many of these mainstream polls indicate. Uh, that's not to say you should ignore the polls. If Trump has a victory here, it would be the biggest polling shock in history. We'd have to go back to President Truman when he won. He was here in St. Louis, standing at Union Station, holding this newspaper uh, because Gallup had a, a, such a high lead for Dewey in the, uh, the polls that they were already in Chicago printing off the paper that Dewey defeats Truman. They were that sure of it. Uh, this would actually be a bigger upset for the polls. Now, what was going on uh, during this election? Well, Gallup was going around, I believe it was Gallup, and they were going uh, at the time door to door and they would ask the polling questions. And uh, the, to do this quickly, the, the individuals doing the poll would go to the street corner and walk to each of the houses on the street corner. Uh, now, what they didn't realize is they were biasing their sample. Uh, the largest house on the street often was the house on the corner, and the, uh, the individual that owned that, the, the largest house on the street, tended to be Republican, so they were capturing more Republicans versus the, uh, the representation. Uh, we also think that this is uh, back to our idea that there's a populist vote that is really hard to poll, uh, and Truman was uh, absolutely running on a populist ticket, uh, and uh, we think that was uh, kind of part of that phenomena that we think is underlying why these polls are, are, uh, are not capturing uh, the reality. Now, um, what we believe is, once again, that, that it's it's a tight election. Uh, it's it, not that President Trump is going to win. And I, it, we, we would love to be able to come out and, and make an audacious claim and, and go against the polls. And, and then uh, that way, what do we have to lose? If, if President Trump uh, loses the election, all the people that were upset that we said that President Trump uh, was going to win. They get to, to gloat and send me an email and say, hey, we told you so. And I got pretty thick skin. I, I'd be okay with that. Uh, I'm indifferent, really, on, on the outcome. I think the, uh, or at least from a market perspective, I think the, the market's going to do well, whether it's a Republican or a Democrat. Uh, of course, if we were right, we're going to look like we were geniuses and we knew something. But we don't. We're data driven. And that data suggests that the polls uh, are not accurate, that this is really a, a neck to neck uh, race. Uh, and, and we uh, so we can't come out and just play some games here uh, trying to, to look good uh, in hindsight and really not pay a price. Uh, that, that's just not what the data is telling us. The data is telling us uh, that it's going to be close. So then our baseline for the election remains contested election. Uh, we do not believe either candidate is going to, uh, uh, to uh, uh, withdraw from the race on November 3rd. Uh, we have a lot of vote by mail uh, that's already in. We have a lot of people, Republicans specifically, that will show up on election day at the polls. Uh, it's, it's been called the red mirage. Uh, and then there's still the vote by mail that has uh, at times days uh, uh, later. So we just think that we're going to be in this because it's going to be close. We're going to be in that baseline, that contested election. Uh, and, and the portfolios are, are built uh, for that uh, type of election. And we're not heavily skewed for a Biden uh, victory. We're not heavily skewed for a Trump victory. We're kind of in the, the middle of the road because when we look at probability, that's where the data is telling us to be. Uh, let's, uh, let's move on to coronavirus. Uh, we do have an increase in cases. 
Uh, we, we've seen that uh, the, the cases are up 30% over the last uh, 14 days. Uh, the death total has been actually declining. Uh, and uh, we, we've all seen this before where we, uh, we just look at the, the, the deaths and the new cases and we look at that, that lag. And if we look at just that blue box in the center, we can see that there was about a four or five week lag. And if we take that same size box and move it to whenever we saw the cases uh, accumulating, uh, we can see that we're about a week past where they started to actually show up in the daily death rate. And that daily death rate we think is the true litmus test. Uh, now we are getting in cooler temperature uh, and uh, I will be uh, like I, I was back in April, uh, May, where I'm measuring this on a day-to-day -day basis to see where that growth rate is coming. Uh, but most of the, the cases are coming in the, the Midwest area, that rural area. Now many weeks back we said that we expected the new cases just to level off uh, that they would continue on in the rural area but there wasn't enough population they were spread out we thought it would just kind of flatline that certainly has not been the case we have seen an appreciation but if you look at the coast and the sun belt we're not seeing a lot of hot spots there uh, it, it's mainly in that midwest area uh, now as i look at this it's not just in the midwest rural area if you notice the big reds are in the cooler areas so that's where my concern is is are we going to have an additional weight uh, uh, growth uh, and a reoccurrence of a that quote unquote second wave uh, not seeing it in the coast uh, yet but it may be the temperature because uh, it's 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 mainly red in the lower temperature uh, areas so know that we'll be looking at this and we're grateful that um, that the death count has not uh, began to appreciate at the same rate as the uh, coronavirus cases are appreciating. Now, if we look at the European Union, it recently surpassed the US in cases uh, and it's now actually gaining uh, on relative deaths. Uh, so the European Union uh, having a stricter lockdown did have a lull. And then when they started to relax that the, the coronavirus did come back and we're getting into this colder weather uh, as well as the the death count is beginning to uh, approach the same death count as the us and actually if you look at italy germany uk uh, and france and you control uh, for the population they are actually having similar results as the united states uh, so one this may take some of the sting out of the criticism that's being used against president trump during these debates uh, that the U.S. has done so poorly relative to others. If you look at the industrial nations uh, and the ones that we most compare to, uh, that's actually not the case. And if the European Union all of a sudden surpasses uh, the, the death rate of the U.S., uh, then, then that can take some of that sting out. We're not saying that he has or hasn't done well. Uh, we're just trying to look at the, uh, the, the data and trying to apply it to the, to the right now. And we have been watching uh, Sweden. Sorry that uh, the Sweden image is coming across so blurry. Uh, why we were looking at it, uh, the historical data has all of a sudden changed on the, uh, the new cases. Uh, we're not going to dig in to try to find out why uh, because it's immaterial really on uh, market performance. We're, we're just trying to understand if there is that herd immunity uh, that has been criticized, but we do believe it, it, it is sound uh, on a scientific principle. That's how we've always dealt with them. The question is, is what percent? Uh, and many people are advocating that it's lower. If that's the case, we assume that Sweden wouldn't uh, increase. And if we look at deaths, it, it's very much the similar pattern of what we were seeing on cases. Uh, it does seem that their, their death count uh, and their, therefore their new cases in reality uh, are not trending the way that they are in Europe, which suggests that they've hit some type of herd immunity. It doesn't prove it. Uh, and then uh, all of this, really what we're, we're trying to understand is are we gonna have additional lockdowns? Because that's how it impacts the, uh, the portfolios and the overall market. The World Health Organization did recommend additional lockdowns. Now, many right and those that have uh, uh, come out against the lockdowns says this is a reversal by the World Health Organization. It's technically reversal. They continue to say that no, if the health system is being overwhelmed, you need to use a lockdown to prevent that. Remember that was flattening the curve. Uh, so they have not reversed 
uh, but they have started to look at some of the, uh, the other externalities of doing these lockdowns, and, and they certainly don't want to uh, belittle uh, the consequences, and that is that it's making poor people an awful lot poorer. Uh, so uh, they are not recommending additional lockdowns while the healthcare system is uh, staying afloat and not have, not being overwhelmed. So we do not see at the moment additional lockdowns in any meaningful way to derail the economy. Shifting gears to the economy, uh, retail sales uh, did come in uh, at uh, a uh, seasonally adjusted 1.9%. Uh, and, and so the, the retail sales have added to GDP. Uh, at the same time, the benchmark 10-year note increased. That means that there's some inflation expectations uh, based on this economic activity. And if we look at the producer price index, you do see that. Now, uh, if we start to, to dig into that, the food costs have been the bigger driver on that PPI. Uh, it, it's up 13% year over year. Uh, so that's, that's significant uh, in, uh, in what we are purchasing. Uh, another area that's been a, 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 just a, a bright uh, spot with through this whole recession has been uh, the residents or home. Uh, and if we look at the uh, NHB housing market index, it rose this month to 85 just here on Monday. And the previous record was set just back in September at 83. It's, and a lot of this is, we believe, it's the low, low mortgage rates that are making homes very affordable. Now, there's a lot of noise that are going, that's going on here um, that we think there could be uh, seeds being laid for an eventual bubble in the housing market. We're not there yet, uh, but if it makes it through this recession and you continue to see gains and people have, have are seeing their net worth go in, you're going to have overinvestment, especially since lumber and other material prices continue to go up, meaning that there are not nearly as many home starts uh, as there are sales. So inventory continues to shrink and demand for houses uh, continues to increase. We see a rising price. So we do have the potential over the next several years to pop, possibly decade to see another bubble in the housing market. Once again, we're not there yet. Uh, I know we've had a lot of questions on that. Know that we are paying attention to it because this is certainly fertile ground for a bubble to, uh, to manifest. On the money supply, we talked about that early on. Uh, it continues to decrease now from a very, very high number. We were up at around 67% for annualized growth. Uh, just now we're down back into about 13%. Uh, and it's the change in growth that matters. Uh, this is a big warning. But remember, we have stimulus packages that may come in. And just recently, this last week, we actually saw a big spike in the money supply as the, uh, the Fed stepped in and bought treasuries. Uh, so it's still too early to tell. Uh, if, if this is, is there and uh, with the stimulus package as a possibility, you just don't want to be out of the market at this time. Know that we are paying a lot of attention to it. Uh, the market continues to, to move up. We think we're going to be moving into a trading range until the economy is fully open. Uh, and there is still California and New York that are on uh, very strict lockdowns. If they were to open back up, uh, so we're, we think we're going to be at 34, 35% for the quarter. If they were open, we think that adds up to 4%, so it could be 39%. So there's still an additional amount of growth that could really come uh, from uh, these two states uh, that really make up 18% of the overall population, uh, or just off 18%. I think I need to add one more state in there to get there. Um, but uh, nonetheless, uh, there, there's still some uh, economies or state economies that have not added to that GDP that can add to it. Uh, we also see an excellent start to earnings season. 13% uh, of the, uh, the, the companies have reported uh, based on my current data. It'll be a little bit older. I don't want to update these slides. Um, uh, as we are approaching this uh, live event. So uh, as we're getting close, uh, now that we have a market close where there's other reporting, that's not included in that. Uh, but most of these uh, companies are 88% of them are actually above uh, uh, their earnings expectations. Uh, so it, it is looking good here, uh, but we do think we're in a trading range until the stimulus bill gets passed or the economies, all the state uh, lockdowns have been removed and banks begin to lend again. I'm going to just 
Skip through the dollar uh, on this slide. We continue to watch it. We do think that it is on a long-term decline, uh, but uh, if, if there's a sell-off because of that money supply, I know the dollar is going to be that safe haven and it'll gain. Um, skipping through the investment theme, uh, whenever we look at relative strength, uh, the positions that we're in are the ones that we're doing well, uh, small cap, mid cap, uh, tech, uh, what it is doing well. It is kind of taking a little bit of breather, uh, but it, these have all turned into nice performance. John, I'll turn it back over to you. Thanks, Aaron. So the key takeaways I heard you say today were the election is much closer than what the national polls and the media are saying. The World Health Organization is questioning the effectiveness of coronavirus lockdowns since these have driven millions around the world into starvation. And so many factors can change the outcome of the election over the next few days. So we must be prepared no matter which candidate wins. So thanks again, everybody, for listening into today's broadcast. Our goal is to sift through the media narratives and give you our data-driven professional view of the economy and the market so you can be better informed. So be sure to, to subscribe to our broadcast by clicking on the subscribe button right down here on the bottom right hand of your video and you'll be alerted to our weekly broadcast and we're also going to be rolling out shortly our future daily three by three in which our chief investment officer Aaron Tuttle summarizes the three key market news facts in three minutes. So if you have any question about your portfolio or like to speak to one of our advisors, please call us at 314-924-5100 or you can reach us through our website at gatewoodwealth.com. Thanks again, and we look forward to having you tune in to our next broadcast.